Oh, good morning, Crossroads. Did he tell you about tagging your gifts? He did mention that? Good, good. I couldn't hear what he was saying. Uh, it is good to see all of you here today, and um, we've been in a series of messages called Reconnecting with God, and this is the last message in this series, and I want to talk about what makes God smile. I mean, really, what, what brings him pleasure? In Psalm 149, verse 4, the Bible says this, The Lord takes pleasure in His people. Those of you who are parents or maybe grandparents, do you take pleasure in watching your your children or your grandchildren? Well, most of the time you probably do. There's something special about watching them and having them be a part of your life. And the same is true about your Heavenly Father. God made you to bring pleasure to Him. He loves you. And one of the primary purposes in your life is to get God's smile. There's a word that God uses to describe when we bring pleasure to Him. And often it's a misunderstood word. It's the word worship. Now let me give you a definition of worship. If you have your bulletins open and up, I want you to fill fill the blanks in as we go along. A definition of worship is this. Worship is living a life pleasing to God. Now, you're filling in the word pleasing. I want you to go back one word and underline the word life. And then I want you to circle it. And then I want you to get a highlighter out and highlight it. This is crucial to understanding what worship really is. Worship is living a life pleasing to God. Worship is your life pleasing to God. Many people don't realize that. When they hear the word worship... They think of things like going to church, or music, or mass, or ritual, or ceremony, or praying, or communion. But worship is not a ritual. It's not a ceremony. Ritual and ceremony can be used as worship, but in and of themselves, they're not worship. In fact, worship isn't even the music. A lot of people use the word worship as a synonym for music. Like, at our church, we do the worship first, and then the teaching. They, they're saying, we do the worship, we do the music first, and then the teaching. Some people say, well, I like the fast praise songs. But, but I really enjoy the worship songs better. So if it's a fast, loud song, it's praise. But if it's slow and quiet and intimate, it's worship. But that's wrong. That's not what God says at all. Worship has nothing to do with the style or the volume or the speed of music. Some people think that worship is when you stand and sing. But real worship is when you raise your hands and sing. Got any hand raisers here? I want you to see this video about a hand-raising church. All right? Cue us up, Joe. All right. So did you find yourself in one of those? Maybe. You're just, your hand. Okay. All right. So we have this, this little bit offbeat idea of what worship really is. It's not any of that. Let me tell you what the Bible says worship is. Look at your outline. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Because of God's great mercy, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to His service and pleasing to Him. This is the true worship that you should offer. What's the true worship you should offer? Yourselves dedicated to God. Your life Your every day, get up, go to school, go to work, come home, 
get things done around the house, go out and have some fun on the weekend. Every aspect of your life should be worship to God. As a matter of fact, it is. If you're living your life in a way that, 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 that says, hey, I love you, God, I'm trying to please you, I'm trying to obey you, then everything you do is worship. Everything. Ephesians 5.10 says this, figure out what will please Christ and then do it. What brings pleasure to God? What makes God smile? If my purpose is to bring pleasure to God, how do you do that? Noah, the ark dude, gives us a great example of how to make God smile. The Bible says in Genesis 6, 8, Noah was a pleasure to the Lord. What did Noah do in his life that made him a pleasure to the Lord? Using him as our example, I want to suggest four things. Four ways we can make God smile. We can bring pleasure to God. Number one, we give God pleasure when we love Him above all else. When we love Him above everything else, when we love Him supremely, that brings pleasure to God. Hosea 6.6 6 says this, God is speaking here and He says, I don't want your sacrifice, I want your love. I don't want your offerings, I want you to know me. First and foremost, God wants a relationship with us. He wants us to know Him. He wants us to love Him, just like He loves us. If you miss that, you miss the very point of life. God wants a personal, everyday relationship with you. And it's amazing that out of all the universe and all the people, God made you. And He made you to be loved by Him. And He simply wants you to love Him back. This is the first reason why God chose Noah. Noah had a relationship with God when nobody else did. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, it says this, Noah consistently followed God's will and enjoyed a close relationship with Him. All of Noah's life, he loved God above everything else. And God has revealed His plan in even more detail. Paul said this in Ephesians 1.5, God's unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into His own family by bringing us to Himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. God wants a family, and you were made to be part of God's family. Not just for the 80 or 90 or 100 years you live down here on earth, but for all eternity. And you do that first of all by saying, God, I want to love you more than anything else. I want to do that. Now, those of you who've had experience with kids, whether they're your kids, your nieces, your nephews, your grandkids, somebody else's kids, when kids are little, they really want your attention, right? And, and if you come home and your kids are there and they're vying for your attention, all you have to do is just get down on their level and they come running to you. And they want to play with you and they want to hug you and they want to kiss you and they want to do fun things with you. And if they're small enough, you see, you know it's genuine because they don't understand allowance yet. So there's no uh, motivation here that's not pure. They just want to be with you. And God feels the same way. When you come to Him and say, God, I'm coming to you because you made me and I want to get to know you and I want to love you more, that thrills God's heart. It brings God great pleasure. It makes God smile. Now we have to be really careful 
Because some of us are doers and some of us are beers. I'm a doer. I like to do. You have something you need help with? Call me. I like to do things. I find things to do when there's nothing to do. I like to do things for people. And then some of you are beers. You just like being around people, the presence and the sharing and the emotion and the love. I don't get that, but that happens. But sometimes we get busy doing for God, and that's all right. But before we do anything for Him, He simply wants us to be with Him. Does that make sense? All right. We give God pleasure, secondly, when we trust Him completely. When we trust Him completely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Psalm 147.11 says this, The Lord takes pleasure in those who honor Him and trust in His constant love. When you trust God, you bring Him pleasure. And Noah trusted God completely. He had incredible faith. In Hebrews 11.7, it says this about Noah. By faith, Noah built a ship in the middle of dry land. He was warned about something he couldn't see, and he acted on something he was told, and his act of faith drew a sharp line between the evil of the unbelieving world and the rightness of the believing world. As a result, Noah became intimate with God. Noah had faith. He trusted God. He was told to build a boat before it ever rained. And Noah didn't complain. He didn't argue. He didn't say, but God. He just trusted God completely. What does it mean to trust God completely? It means you trust Him to know what's best for your life. It's when you say, God, you know better than I do what's best for my life, so I'm going to trust you. It means you trust God to answer your prayers even though you haven't seen that answer yet. You trust God to keep His promises even though you haven't seen them yet. You trust Him, ultimately. In Psalm <clears throat> verse 50, I'm sorry, Psalm 50, verse 14, look what it says. I want you to trust me. This is God speaking. I want you to trust me in your times of trouble so I can rescue you and you can give me glory. He said, I want you to trust me in your times of trouble. You know why we don't trust God? Because sometimes we don't realize how big He really is. It's so easy to forget how great, how powerful, how huge God is. And what we tend to do is we tend to shrink God down to our size. We whittle Him down. There should be a movie called, Honey, I Shrunk My God. Because we do that. We put Him on our level. How do you know when you've made God too small? Because when you have problems in your life, you don't go to Him. You tell yourself things like, I can handle this. I can take care of this. Let me do this. But that doesn't make sense. Because we don't have more energy or more strength or more brains or more wisdom or more power or more resources than God does. Why would we want to do that? If you want to please God, if you want God to smile on your life, You've got to let God be God and be as big and great in your life as He wants to be. You've got to say, God, I want you to be magnified in my eyes because I've made you too small and I'm sorry for it. I've limited you. My lack of faith stops what you want to do in my life. Bring back the smile of God in your life by trusting Him supremely and greatly and fully. Now, there are some areas in your life right now I'm sure you can think of where you're going, you know what, I need to trust God with this. I need to trust God with this relationship. I need to trust God with my finances. I need to trust God with, with what's going on in my family that I can't control. Trust Him. Number three, we bring God pleasure 
when we obey him wholeheartedly. James 2, verse 24, talks about this. The Bible says, We please God by what we do, and not only by what we believe. James isn't talking here about earning your way to heaven or into the family of God. You never earn God's love. You don't earn your way into God's family. You don't earn salvation. You don't work for it. It's given to us as a gift by God's love and His grace. I mean, think about it this way. None of you, none of us, earned our birthright, right? I mean, you didn't even know about being a person before you were born. You had nothing to do with your birth. So you can't claim credit that you were born. But once you were born into a family, there were ways that family could bring you pleasure. And there were ways you could bring your family pleasure. One of the ways is to do what you're asked to do. Doesn't it bring you pleasure when you ask your student or you ask your co-worker or you ask your child or you ask your daughter? Doesn't it bring you pleasure when you say, hey, could you do this? Would you do this? And they just instantly, yes. And they're, they're doing it. That's incredible. God wants the same thing from us. It's okay to ask God questions. You know I believe that. You don't have to. I mean, you can say, God, it doesn't make sense to me. God, I don't agree with this. Whatever, whatever. But you need to obey Him while you're asking Him the questions. You don't wait and say, I want all these things answered. If God says do it, you do it. And Noah, again, gives us a great example of wholehearted obedience. In Hebrews 11, verse 7, again, it says, Noah obeyed and built a boat. He obeyed. He said, all right, God, yes, I'll do it. Genesis 6, 22, it says, Noah did everything exactly as God commanded him. He did exactly what God said in the exact way that God said to do it. So what does it mean to obey God wholeheartedly? Well, it means, first of all, you do it without any reservations. Wholeheartedly also means no procrastination. Any procrastinators here? Yeah, if you're a real procrastinator, you would say, I'll tell you tomorrow, right? When God says do something, he doesn't want us waiting around. He wants us to do it at that time. God's told you to do all kinds of things. And when you say, well, I'm thinking about it, that's disobedience. God wants you to be obedient. It's an attitude that David had. Look at Psalm 119, verse 33. He's talking to God and he says, just tell me. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it, Lord. As long as I live... I will wholeheartedly obey. If you say, after being here at our service today, if you say, Lord, from this day forward, the number one thing in my life is the smile of God to please the one who made me, it's going to mean you're going to have to obey him at the very time he leads you to do something. There's going to be times in your life that wholehearted obedience means doing something that's inconvenient, something that's unpopular, doing something that's going to cost you something, doing something that's not easy. doesn't matter. You still obey God and do it. And number four, we bring God pleasure when we fulfill His purposes. We bring Him pleasure when we fulfill His purposes. God smiles on our lives when we fulfill the purposes that He's put us to fulfill down here on this earth. In Genesis 9-1, after the flood is over and the ark has landed and they are getting out of the boat, here's what God says. Then God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. God said to Noah, Here's what I want you to do. 
I want you to have sexual relations with your spouse. I want you to raise your family. I want you to do the things that I created human, human beings to do. And that is to be human. I want you to procreate the planet. Folks, God made you to be human. He gave you certain abilities and capacities as a human being and asks us to live within our humanness to bring him pleasure. And this is very important, folks, because a lot of you think the only time God is smiling in your life is when you're doing something religious. For instance, right now, you came to church. Good. So you think, all right, God's smiling at me. Then after church, some of you are going to go to La Hacienda. And you think, no way God can smile at me at La Hacienda. But the fact is, if God leads you to go eat cheap imitation Mexican food, have at it. He's smiling. He doesn't care if you get heartburn. It's like the Olympic runner Eric Little. Some of you may remember from a long time ago the movie called Chariots of Fire. And Eric Little was given the gift of running. And in the movie, he made a statement. He said, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Not when I'm in church, not when I'm at home doing a Bible study, not when I'm in small group. You feel it then too. He said, I I feel God's pleasure when I run. Why? Because God wired him to be a runner. And he was doing what God wired him to do. And God takes pleasure when you be the person God wants you to be and you do the things that God wants you to do. What I'm saying, folks, is everything in life can be done as an act of worship. Everything in life can be done to bring God glory. Everything can be done for God's pleasure. So if you say, God, today I want to live for your pleasure... Maybe you need to go home and wash dishes. You do it, and God will smile and give you pleasure. Maybe you think you need a break, and you want to go play golf this afternoon. Go for it. God will smile. You bring him pleasure. Probably laugh at you, too. You need to go home and take care of your lawn? Do it. Can that be worship? Absolutely. Absolutely. Everything you do in life can be done to bring God pleasure if you've got the right attitude. And you're saying, God, you've given me this ability, you've given me this responsibility, and I want to please you with it. You can please God wherever you are as long as you live for His pleasure. That includes, by the way, did you see the cards we put on, your, on the benches? This is an invite card that you can hand out to invite people to Christmas Eve. It also has our regular time on there. I want you to take these. Now, some of you may not have noticed them. When you stand up, they're going to fall off the backside that you have there. Pick them up. We want you to invite people to Christmas Eve. Is it worshipful for you to go and say, hey, I'd love for you to come to church with us. Here's a card. You know what? That's an act of worship. You say, that just doesn't sound right, Kevin. I know it doesn't, but it's what the Bible teaches. It's what the Bible says. Put this one in my pocket. Look at Psalm 37, 23. The steps of the godly are directed by the Lord. He delights in every detail of their lives. Did you know that God delights in the details of your life? When you use a talent or an ability that God gave you, you do it for His glory, it's an act of worship, and God delights in that. Hebrews 13, 16. God takes particular pleasure in acts of worship, a different kind of sacrifice that takes place in the kitchen and the workplace and on the streets. Read at it. Read, read, read that again. God takes particular pleasure in acts of worship, 
a different kind of sacrifice that takes place in the kitchen and the workplace and the streets. Did you realize you can worship God a hundred times a day just by doing what He wants you to do? I I don't know if I'm stretching it or not. I I think it's a pretty good application, but Libby and I got a ping pong table a few weeks ago, and I rule the ping pong table. I rule it. I wonder, Libby, is it an act of worship when I beat you so often? Ping pong. (laughs) I knew I was stepping out of bounds there. But we, we can have fun. And when we do it, it's part of life. The Bible says that's part of worship. You know when you went shopping for the angel tree gifts that we're going to give these families for these kids. You know that? When you went and did that at Walmart and you were walking around picking out the gifts and trying to find what to get, when you did that, that was worship. Are you getting my point? Do you understand? Because I can go longer. No, just kidding. God is good to look at us and accept all those different things as worship. In John 3.19, it says this. This is the crisis we're in. God's light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. The Bible says God's on the lookout. He's on the lookout for modern-day Noahs, 21st century Noahs. He's looking for people to say, I want to live my life for the pleasure of God. I want to live my life the way my Creator made me to do it. And by the way, that that won't hinder your enjoyment of life. It will expand it. It will bless it tremendously. Psalm 14.2 says, The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who are wise, who want to please God. I want to challenge you to be that person. I want to challenge you to say, God, I, I want to be like Noah. I want to live my life for your smile, for your pleasure. I know sometimes you think that's hard to do. And the fact is, in our own strength, in our own power, we will blow it. It's not, what if I blow it? It's, you will blow it. We can't do it all on our own. But look what the Bible says in 2 Peter 1.3. Everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God. The one who invites us to God is his son, Jesus Christ. And it's the greatest invitation you're ever going to get. And God says, I want you to please me. And I've already provided the way you can please me. You just receive Christ as your Savior. You commit your life to him. You accept his forgiveness. You get to have the gift of eternal life in heaven. And I'll give you the power to live your life through my Son, through the Holy Spirit, so you can do this on a daily basis. I want you to think for the rest of this day at least, if not through the week preferably. How can I bring God pleasure? How can I receive God's smile? You do it by trusting Him. You do it by loving Him. You do it by obeying Him. You do it by realizing everything I do in life, if I'm doing my best, if I'm doing it with the right attitude, with the right love for God, and I'm trying to do it obediently, it's worship to God. That's what brings Him pleasure. That sounded like an amen to me. Let's pray together. God, I want to thank you for this day and for what your word has taught us today. Father, we sometimes wrongly get this idea in our heads that worship is some where we go and something we do while we're in church or if we're at a Bible study. That's worshipful, but that is not what worship is, Father. I want to thank you for clearly reminding us today that worship is is our life 
dedicated to you and that in everything we do, every part of life, as we live it for you and to you, that is worship. Lord, we can worship you in so many different ways with our gifts and our talents, places we work. Work in in and of itself is a form of worship because you made us to do it. Help us to realize, Lord, to give our lives to you. That is worship. And so, Lord, help us to worship by giving our lives to you, by renewing that trust and that love in our relationship with you, by allowing you to take control of our lives. Help us to trust you wholeheartedly, to obey you, right away help our love for you to grow so indeed you will smile on our lives and our lives will bring you great pleasure now lord bless our time that follows here the song the response we pray your holy spirit will uh, work in us encourage us and challenge us In Jesus' name we pray, amen.